Dr. Justin Spees. Can you hear me? What's up, brother? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. As you said that I'm no longer allowed here and that court security is going to come remove me from here. That's a threat. Well, I mean, that's a fact. So are you going to call him then, Josh? Well, if we get the form for you, you can be on your way. Well, I'm going to fill it out here too as well. So That's, that's not going to happen. Oh, it is going to happen because I'm allowed to do it. All right, well, here's what we're going to do. Yeah, this is great, man. I appreciate uh, I appreciate you, you doing this, man. Heck yeah. From Lawrence, Kansas, we have a man, an activist, a YouTuber, and much, much more. We're going to get to know him better in this interview. And uh, I have some questions for the Dreaded Rabble Rouser. Some quick questions. You can answer them if you want. You could just say skip. We'll skip it if you don't want to answer it. Where does the name Dreaded Rabble Rouser come from? So it, it's kind of a couple of things. So first of all, you know, with the, the dreads here, so dreaded. But then that also means, you know, dreaded in the sense that, you know, it, people are fearful or apprehensive about, you know, someone showing up with, with uh, you know, more or less accountability, um, but also ties into the, the rabble rouser. So they dread the, the, the rabble rousing. And I always like that. I always like that uh, phrase rabble rouser for some reason. It, it, it uh, kind of goes back to makes me think of like revolutionary time period where people were rabble rousing and basically that's trying to inspire uh, inspire people to uh in my case use their voices and, and stand up and exercise their rights so it's the dreaded rabble rouser hey mr spears mr spears, mr. spears you're under arrest for what you need to place your hands on your back for disrupting a business meeting and refusing to leave for disrupting a meeting so your name is dr justin spees are you really a doctor Yep, I have a I have a PhD in human development uh, from Kansas State University, there there in Manhattan, Kansas. But I have, I have other degrees as well. So I, I started out my education the last uh, three years that I was in the Navy. So I was in the Navy from 2000 to 2009, and uh, I was on a submarine then. And I, I transferred to to shore duty for the last three years, and I. Uh, transferred to shore duty to San Diego and I started doing, I was like, well, I'm going to be getting out in three years. I need to have, you know, I need to have some sort of profession. And so I started going to school there at a community college studying addiction counseling. And so I got my associates at San Diego City College. On the day that I got out of the Navy, I got my associates in alcohol and other drug studies, and transferred and moved to, to Kansas when I got out transferred to a university in, in Topeka, Kansas called uh, Washburn University. And I did my bachelor's in addiction counseling there. And then uh, after that, I went and got my master's at my master's degree at Kansas State University. And my master's is in marriage and family therapy. And then from there, I went on and got a PhD, like I mentioned, in lifespan human development there at Kansas State U University as well. And, and basically what what a lifespan human development is like if you took a if you were going to college and you took um you know like a in like human development 101 you'll learn about the lifespan from conception to to death and beyond and so that that's what my that's what my degree is in and uh <clears throat> i taught along the way and all all those kind of fields as well in the human development field and the human services field and the addiction counseling field at washburn university i was a uh, st I worked my way up to uh, an assistant professor, a tenure track position there. And so I was doing all that from about 2007 to about 2008 to, d to do my degrees and stuff. So it was um, it was quite a process. Well, uh, when uh, listening to you on your videos, I can tell that you're a pretty wise dude. Like you have a pretty wide vocabulary. You're a smart dude, I can tell. So... Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, my my secret, I guess you can call it my secret is, you know, each time I go in to speak, I pray and I ask Jesus for words and wisdom because he promises that if you read Luke and, and John, he promises us words and wisdom. And uh, so that that's that's what it's all about um, and having faith that he'll deliver. And he always does. That actually goes with my next question that I was about to ask you, uh, which is. Several of your videos, you do mention being of Christian faith. And, uh, you know, this is something that you seem to be proud of, right? Yep. 
I am proud of it because, uh, you know, I, the, the proof is, is there. I'm proud of it. God has uh, shown himself in my life um, in, in the stuff that I do in, in the videos. That's that's all God. And, you know, prior to what we see on, on my videos and, and whatnot is um, I had started a protest in, uh, during COVID for the child's mandates that were put in place for the second time in the school district where I lived. And up until the day that I went out there on uh, that first day to protest, I was an atheist. You know, I was a, you know, I was a professor and I was an atheist. I thought I knew everything. Uh, I was also, you know, I was also a therapist as well. And, and my, my primary focus was from an existential point of view and and that entailed in an in, in atheist point of view and things on you know you know death and life meaning and stuff like that and so i was pretty well entrenched in being an atheist i thought i knew it all but you know turns out i didn't know shit really and so it all started on that day that i walked out there i i didn't know jesus at all and as i'm walking out there i knew something was Something was going on. I couldn't quite place it because, and I'm not joking, as I'm walking out there that first day, I could, I could feel something and um, I couldn't quite place it, but uh, quickly came to realize that it was it was Jesus working in my life. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm proud as shit about it because God has shown me uh, and I and I hope that I'm showing people is, you know, if he's with you and on your side, you know, you, you can you can stand up and you, you can you can go against the current of society you can go against unpopular positions you can put yourself out there you can take risks and you can suffer severe consequences for doing all that stuff part of the inspiration and messaging behind behind what i'm doing is um people seeing that you know the 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 perseverance you know the perseverance and that all comes from that all comes from jesus without a doubt I uh, sometimes I feel like um, miracles are shown to us for our own eyes to see only sometimes not for everybody else and yeah. sometimes they're shown to us at the right time maybe we lack faith or or we don't believe or whatnot and uh, I personally have grown up a Christian and uh, with Christian faith I went to youth groups as a kid and I used to sing in church. My mom used to laugh and, you know, tell me about it and stuff. And, nice. But yeah, did, I, did you grow up Catholic or what, what's, what, uh, what part of the, yeah, what, what part in there? Uh, I, mean, I mean, not necessarily a specific Christian church. It was just a yeah. Christian church that I grew up in. You know, it wasn't like a, a certain specific one that I remember. Yeah. That's been my experience. So, so once I, uh, once I um, started going back to church in, in 2021, which was shortly after I started that protest, um, I started attending a non-denominational church. And along the way, you know, I, I left that church and, and attended some other ones, and they were all non-denominational as well. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm familiar with what, what you're talking about there. Ultimately, I've landed on Catholicism again. I was, uh, I was born and and uh, grew up Catholic, uh, not in any strict sense of the word at all, um, but was familiar with it all and, and knew and, and knew what it was about because I was around it enough. And then got away from it, you know, like most people do at a, at a young age, like 12 or 13 young, and, and got away from Catholicism and just religion in, in, in general, just away from it all. And But I've come to realize through, you know, what I'm going through right now with, with um you know, coming to know Jesus, that for me, Catholicism is where it is at for me because of the Eucharist, because of the, you know, the, the communion, uh, the body and, and uh, blood of Jesus. And that's an important part of it. And that's something that for me was missing from the other places. So for me, that's, that's what works for me. And, and um, it's, it's been really, it's, you know, it's been really good. Um, and in reality, what we do on our channels really kind of narrows down to the First Amendment and freedom of religion, freedom from religion, being an atheist, Christian, uh, Catholic, Muslim. In America, is something a little bit different that I see regarding, like, for instance, the difference between politics and religion is I see a lot of people getting offended if someone leans left or someone leans right. But when it comes to our religion or someone else's religion, it's like, oh, that's their faith. 
for instance, an atheist, maybe an atheist might get offended or something, but sometimes we see people like say someone fights in the octagon and they win at the end, they say, you know, I owe it all to God. I owe it all to God. I don't really see a lot of people getting offended when it comes to religion, because I think people understand that in this country, we have a right to believe in the God we want to believe in or not believe. And I think that's yeah. a beautiful thing about this country. Yeah, Do you agree? absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's what I that, you know, <clears throat> that's part of being an American is not yeah. only having that freedom, but also to be accepting of of all those other uh, views and, and beliefs as well. hundred right. percent. Yeah. Same thing with free, freedom of speech. Uh, to to be just accepting of the fact that the person has the right to to say what they want to say, and and to not yeah you know, I mean you can get offended by it but not to take it to the extreme of trying to shut them down or not you know, letting them talk and stuff like that. Right. We'll change the subject a little bit. Sure. I, I personally want to know this about you. What's your favorite kind of food? Well, uh, my my favorite food pro probably overall is, uh, I, I like Mexican food, but I'll tell you my most consistent food, which I guess makes it my favorite, is I eat a uh, just a peanut butter sandwich with, with honey and cinnamon and sugar on it every day for lunch. And so uh, I like that a lot. It's a, it's a good mixture. It's a good combination, and it, it seems to work for me. So That sounds delicious. I might make one for lunch yeah, today. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your favorite food? What do you like to eat? Ah, oh, I love sushi, but I just can't afford it <laughs> all the time. So. I, bet. I bet. We sushi. We eat a lot yeah, of Mexican right. food at home. Do you? Yeah, we yeah. make make food. Heck yeah! All right. Um, what is your favorite movie of all time? Well, my favorite movie of all time is A Few Good Men. I I, I love that. I love that movie for a lot of different reasons. Of course, the storyline, but. I like how it's set in the '90s, the '90s military, where it was, you know, a, 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 you know, it was like the last of the hardcore of it. It was a different time period, a different setting. Um, you know, I, I like how it, the story is set up, where they, you know, Tom Cruise's attorney, uh, he gets assigned this high-profile case because they just assume that he's going to do a plea deal. That that was his thing. He was a plea deal lawyer. And turns out, no, he's actually got some backbone and spine and he reaches into his family. His dad was an attorney and stuff like that. And so, and then, you know, we all seen it. But at the end, he challenges that that general and, and, and gets him on the stand to get him triggered, basically, and gets him to admit to the crime. And you have those iconic scenes there. You can't handle the truth and, and right. that kind of stuff. But it's a great movie. I love that one. Nice. Great answer, man. Nobody's answered that one yet. Good answer on that one. All right. Yeah. Right. Favorite music artist of all time. All right. Uh, yeah, Waylon Jennings. Cowboys, don't let your mamas grow up to be babies. Something like that. That's Willie's part. I, lo I love Waylon Jennings. You know, I, I always said, like, if I was in charge of uh, the school education of the public schools, I'd have uh, mandatory Waylon Jennings uh, uh, listening for, for the young boys to listen to and just just start to learn how to be, you know, what, what the ideal of a, you know, a man is. And, uh, because, you know, he lived it, you know, he lived what, what he sang. And, and so there was, it wasn't phony. It was, a, you know, the outlaw country music. That was the life that he was living and, and they were living and they were all about it. They said what they meant and meant what they said. And I think we've kind of gotten away from that in society. So I think he provides a good example of that. And, you know, just his songs are just badass. You know, you, you can you can put them on and just, you know, drive and listen to them. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're just really cool sounding songs. Nice. Heck yeah. Good answer. Um, favorite book of all time? Well, the, the Bible. I, I'm really into the Bible. And I'm really into right now reading uh, John and, and Luke uh, repeatedly. Uh, I, I really like it tells the story of of Jesus and it has a lot of uh, Jesus's actual words um, you know his quotes in there of the lessons he taught and and just how Jesus was as a person and, and I really like I really like that and it just helps me think about he's God and God designed man and he designed masculinity and so he's now in the form of human. He's human form in Jesus. He had to have been the most masculine that could do it, could do anything. And so if you were in his presence, you knew you were in the presence of, of a God that had created 
and had the blueprint of what it means to be a man. And I don't mean human. I mean just actual man, man itself, a male. And so I, I just like to think about what, what he'd actually be like. Because I think sometimes he gets portrayed as like being kind of like a soft, hip, hippie-ish kind of guy. But I think he would have been the, the walking around like, you know, I'm, I created what I am right now. And I'm going to show you what the perfection of man looks like. And so he provides just the perfect example. And, and despite all of that, despite all that, he still was uh, not believed. He was still called a crazy person, a madman, and he was killed for it. And he was killed for it. And so despite him setting that example, people still didn't believe. And so uh, I, I get a lot of, I get a lot of, uh, you know, inspiration from the example that Jesus said, especially knowing that um, he was called crazy. Because that's when I started that protest, and even now when I go and speak, the, the people people call. But I mean, you can even look right now, and you know, there's you know people writing on there like when Josh Seiden impersonated me. It's you know, DA dresses up as local crank. You know, like I'm the crazy person, and I say, well, you know, they call Jesus crazy, so you know, I'm in good company, man. <laughs> I'm in good company, and and that's really all that I need for for an example. I mean, I mean, just think about that. Jesus Christ was called crazy. So, I mean, we're not above that. I'm not, I'm not above being called those kind of things. If they called Jesus those things and he went through it, then we certainly can go through it as well. And, and, uh, and so he provides a good example how to, how to uh, go through that. And that's where it ties into the, the words and wisdom that I talked about that he promises us. He talks specifically about when you get persecuted. To not worry about what you're going to say because he'll give you words and wisdom. That's just, you know, that's a really, that's a really cool promise to make to people. But the, the trick is to have faith that that's going to happen. And I really do believe that faith without works is dead because your works tests your faith. And it, it tests it in ways that you just aren't going to be tested by sitting on the sidelines just on a steady diet of Sunday, Sunday masses. Basically, being cowardly the rest of the the rest of your life. There's no test there. There's no ad, adversity. There's there's no reason to look to Jesus if you're if you're not being tested along those lines. So I, I really do believe that faith without works is dead. And I and again I hope when people see my story they they see that they see that that my the works that I'm doing and have done with the protests and running for office and 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 the way I speak at these meetings that's the works that I'm doing and it's through it's through faith. It's through faith, and um, there. And for me, there's there's no denying that. I hope people see that and, and for what it is. Yeah, uh, brilliance is craziness up until it works, and uh, I personally see the brilliance in your work. So, yeah. Man. Well, again, you know, it's it's all it's all Jesus, and and what I mean by that, obviously, I talk about the words and wisdom, but for me, this whole experience is just. I've always described it as unfolding. Nothing is ever. Uh, you know, anticipated. Nothing is ever uh, planned or created. It's always just unfolded. And and it's when I try to, in my past life, try to get in the way is when it fucks shit up. And so this just unfolds. And in the unfolding process, you, you see this wild, wild story develop from the day that I started the protest all the way up until present day. It is a wild story. And it all unfolded. And it was all uh, me just allowing it to unfold, uh, recognizing that it needed to unfold the way that it God wanted it to and recognizing that it's God's work at hand. And that and that means not just my actions, but that the actions around me are, are unfolding in the way that God wants it to. And that's how it all kind of comes together the way that it has. Outstanding. Um, it's good to hear you speak unafraid of your your faith, because I believe that a lot of people are afraid to speak about their faith. And one time I just said, screw it. I'm going to just talk about my Christianity on my channel. And when I did, I got like a thousand subs that day. And I was like, what the heck? Wow, man. Yeah. Like, so awesome. I understand, That's man. A, well, you know, uh, you know, God loves that. He, he loves it when we, we talk about him in a, in a good way and promote him. And, and he'll reward that. And that's the other thing with all this. He'll, he'll reward he'll reward uh, our efforts for doing what he wants us to do. And he really likes bravery. It, it does take uh, bravery to be a Christian and, and openly talk about it. And he, he, he rewards. He, he looks down and sees and likes uh, people being brave. And he sees us being brave. And I got to tell you, you know, part of part of the reason why I, I'm 
I'm, I feel like I need to speak out about it is because Christians are, they get pushed around a lot and they, they do it to themselves. They do it to themselves. They get pushed around a lot in ways that other groups of people don't. In particular, there, during COVID, like I said, at the beginning of COVID, I was an atheist up until that protest started, but there was a period there during COVID where I was an atheist and, and I was paying attention to what was going on in the country, as I'm sure all of us were. And I remember thinking to myself early on, I said, you know, all this madness of shutdowns and lockdowns and closing down shit is going to stop once the Christians, uh, once they come for the Christians churches, because the Christians, they're crazy and they're not going to put up with that. that. That's what I thought. And then the churches shut down and the Christians didn't show up. And I said, oh, we're fucked. We're fucked. There, there's nobody else. There's nobody else that we can turn to as a large group. And so I, I always was disappointed in, in Christians in that. Um, because, you know, first of all, it's it's freedom of religion in America. We, you know, we the government can't tell us to shut down. We all, and every Christian should have been outraged by that. But secondly, it's the government that now saying how Christians have to practice their religion and, and all religions, frankly. But I'm talking about Christians right now saying that they had to do it online. And then Catholics even more, because like I talked about earlier, you know, it's the Eucharist. It's the communion. You have to actually get it and, and take it. And if you're online, you're not doing that. And that was a severe, severe restriction of their religion. And as far as I can tell, they were practically not nowhere to be seen. They weren't, I think I'm breaking. Uh, right. And so they weren't outraged. They they weren't demanding that they are at their church. I mean, maybe they were, but I, I wasn't seeing it. I wasn't hearing. I'm still not aware that that happened. But I tell you right now, if they were to happen again, now me as a Christian, uh, I would be beating on the door of the church saying, just open it up. It would be the same stink that I, you know, that I raised you know, on COVID. I just open it up. What are you guys doing? There needed to be more backbone from, from all Americans, but there needed to be more backbone from, you know, religious groups that were being told how to practice their religion here in COVID. There, there needed to be a lot more uh, fearless bravery. There needed to be a lot more uh, spine and fortitude and, and leadership, quite frankly, and leadership. And their argument would be, well, our, our, the leaders of the church, they were, they were looking out for their flock and they were trying to keep everybody safe. But that's just, you know, that's just cowardly talk right there. That, that's just trying to, to, to justify their, their cowardice, um, I, I believe, I believe. And so that, that's why I think it's important that Christians start to start to, start to speak up a little bit more, uh, just, just so that we don't continue to get pushed around. And, and we tend to tend to do it in the sense that well, we're so dang nice and, you know, we turn the cheek. But... Again, Jesus sets the example as well. He, it, that's not always the case. That when something is wrong that needs to be set right, we need to set it right. So he'd go into the temple if they were into the church, if they were misusing the way that God said the church was to be used by, you know, collecting taxes and selling stuff in there. He felt it was justified and more and right and righteous to uh, tip those tables over and he pulled out a whip too. And, uh, you know, th there's a message in that. And so I think Christians um, ignore that and, and instead tap tap into their um, their lack of fortitude and try to say that, oh, we're just nice and we turn the other cheek. But really, it's, you know, we're just lacking that fire in the belly and, and that fortitude that that's there that God sets or that Jesus sets the example for. And we just need to tap into it a little bit more, I believe. And so I feel it's my you know, it's my responsibility to do what I can to put my money where my mouth is. I, I can't call out other Christians and then also, you know, not right. try to myself, you know. Yeah. Um, assembly is also part of the First Amendment, not just religion and which, you know, people have the right to assemble in a church. Mm -hmm. So yep. do you still watch television? If so, what do you watch? I don't. I don't watch television. My my life uh, was completely turned upside down. It was an eye opening experience when COVID happened. You know, I used to be a big uh, sports fan. I watched all kinds of sports. I loved NBA basketball. I loved football. Just just like everybody, I, I loved it. it. I followed it all the time. And then COVID happened, and I saw how these organizations basically contributed to everybody's fear and uh, set the narrative and set the stage and, and closed and closed down and shut down. Among other things, they got political as well around that time, summer 2020. They got really pol political. Um, you know, they don't support what my Amer you know, my American views. And so I haven't watched sports since then. Uh, I don't watch TV because I say I see the same thing. I, I basically I see it for what it is. It's culture. It's 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 the culture that we're supposed to be rejecting as as Christians. Now, I'm not saying I've, I've rejected, you know, it, 
you know, I, I pay attention to things on, on YouTube and I'm not, you know, just a hundred percent of my, my time all on, you know, just sitting reading the Bible. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I've, I've uh, come to realize that uh, society, you know, our culture obviously comes through the, the TV. It comes through the people that are on the TV and the messaging that comes to the TV and, and, and how, how oftentimes wrong the messaging is, but also how much of an influence it is on our on our day to day, and it makes us pay attention to things that and they really aren't that important. They really aren't. I mean, even if even if you're a diehard fan and your your team wins, I mean, ultimately, what what does that really even do? I mean, you can only take that so far in your own personal life. I mean, even if you're on the team and won the championship, you can only take that personally so far. Um, so, so there are other things to be paying attention to, and, and I really feel that it's, um, you know, getting involved in, in some in some way at the local level, whether it's doing some kind of protest, whether it's showing up and, and paying attention to the meetings that are taking place. I feel like, you know, if we got time to sit there and watch a meaningless football game and then bitch about how our country is, well, we should just ditch that meaningless game and go spend that three hours down at the local meeting using our American rights. You know, we we don't have any reason to bitch and complain if we're not doing, you know, you know if we're not doing our part, you know, you got to do your part. And I, I think that the, um, uh, the, the idea of what it means to be an American, especially an American male these days, is simply just sitting around, you know, watching sports, gambling on sports and, and stuff like that. And we've gotten so far away from what it probably really means. Like back in the day in the revolutionary time, it was paying attention to what's going on, uh, being men, using our voices, getting into discussions there, in face-to-face -face discussions, uh, calling out our political leaders, holding them accountable. And we've just gotten so dang far removed from that. And I, and I think that, you know, COVID was an excellent opportunity to to hit a reset button on society and America in general and how we want to do things and what, how we want to redefine ourselves. But no, what ended up happening is everybody just rushed right back to try to get back to the, the way things were just, they could not wait to get back to it instead of, instead of just pausing just being like, something's not right here. I don't know what it is. Some, something's not right. I'm, I want to, yeah, I'm going to look into this a little bit further. People became aware of what was going on, but they immediately went right back to heads in the sand or also um, not heads in the sand, but uh, paying attention, but uh, not doing anything about it. Just talking shit online or bitching and moaning online and thinking that's somehow some act of exercising your free rights or your free speech rights. But I, I call it like our, our American identity, our American DNA, what, what it is in our American DNA. And I think it's a rebellious spirit. I, I think that's exactly what it means to be an American. Like if somebody tells you you can't say it, you should be like, fuck you. I'm going to say it and I'm going to say it 10 times now. I'm going to say it 10 times more now because you said I couldn't do it. Right. That kind of rebellious spirit. And I, and I think that that spirit has been taken away because of fear and, and cancel culture and losing control of, of the the narrative as the majority of Americans. Like we, we shouldn't fear. You know, I always took issue with like this silent majority bullshit because first of all, if, if you're a majority of people, there's no reason to be silent. You, you should be loud. Second of all, I don't have respect for a silent minority. Like if, even if you're a minority, you should not be silent. You should still be loud. You should still be loud. And I think that that's an excuse that, for, and sec, third of all, I don't think that there's a silent majority on the right. I don't think that's the case. I think we've lost, I think we're losing it. And um, and if we do have a majority, it's a very slim majority, razor slim. And so, but I think this idea of a silent majority was an excuse and we're all looking for excuses for, uh, for people to not have to individually step out and do something. They took reassurance in this, this mythical group that they were in that had the majority and somehow it would work its way out whether we put in the effort or not and still had all that fear because they knew that if you step out as an individual like like i did you become you become a lone wolf not not in any kind of violent sense of the way but you're the lone you're the lone wolf and you get you get sacrificed you get slaughtered right there by cancel culture by the left mm -hmm. it, and uh, and people see that and they go, well, shit, I don't want that. I got a life and a family and, and a job and I don't want to lose all that shit. And it's like, well, yeah, no shit. You know, I don't I didn't want to either. <laughs> I didn't fucking want to lose, you know, my my previous life. You know, I was married and had, I have two kids and now uh, I'm divorced and went through a period there where I didn't talk to my kids at all. And, and I didn't know if I ever would be, be precisely because of these the, the protests and, and how I was. 
you know, treated here around here and it got to be too much, too much for them. And so I understand people's fear of that. But the, the you know, the frustrating part about it is if and that's what I was saying all along, then is that, you know, if more people would have stood up and, and, and said, no, I'm not doing this COVID shit. Like if everyone that was against it, instead of either just bitching about it or going along with it and, and not liking it, if they all instead would have tapped into that American DNA and said, nope, I'm not fucking doing that shit. There, there wouldn't be lone wolves. There, there would have been a, a large group of people, the majority that would have put down all this un-American stuff going on. And that same mindset, that that same thing I'm talking about applies to all areas that we see today that we're, we're not we're not happy. You know, if we're not happy with what's going on with the way governments restrict and speech, then we all should stand up if we have a problem with it, not just allow one or two two people to go and do it and, and just get taken down right away. You know, we all got to we all got to do a little bit. We all got to do a little bit more. We got we all got to do our parts as Americans. I mean, just sitting around bitching about it ain't going to do nothing. And this ain't a call. I always have to say this ain't a call to go do something violent. It's a it's a call to get up off your ass. Go use your voice as an American. It feels fucking good to use those rights before before you lose them. It's like we taking them for granted. It's like, oh, yeah, I have free speech, but I ain't going to use it. I, just, I have it. But, you know, what are you going to do when it's gone? And, th and that's precisely what's happening. And you can look to my story to see that I'm that's not I'm not being dramatic. I'm not being hyperbolic. The, the free speech rights are being restricted for me for, for exercising them. And so they are being eroded. And if people have an issue with that and are concerned with that, then I, then they also need to do their part as well and go start speaking and uh, or, or just paying attention. I always say like the, the first step is to just go to a meeting, sit your ass in the in the chair, whatever, wherever it is, whether it's your city, your school board, your county, your health department, your library, that all of our government uh, entities in our local areas have those meetings. Go to one of them and just sit there and start observing and start paying attention and you'll learn because you, you, I, I guarantee people think they know a lot more than than what they actually do when it comes to this. Because usually when I see somebody that's come to a meeting for the first time, they said, I had no idea that it was like that. Or I didn't realize this is what was going on. It's like, yes, precisely, precisely. And they they want, the, the government wants that. They want to be operating in the darkness. And so us showing up, we are the light and we're shining light on it. And that's why you start to see them re react and restrict because they don't want that light shine on them. And I think that that's our duty as American citizens is to um, shine the light. And you don't even necessarily, you know, going to meetings is, is one thing, but do other things. You can go and do uh, records requests, open records requests. Just go in there and ask, do some records requests. Just start doing your own looking and, and, and light shining and, and, and see see if you like it and see how it works and see how it goes. You, you can do all those things. There's many things, many, many things that we can do. But it all goes back to what I was talking about there. We seem to be too distracted by by culture and, and society. And so... Uh, you know, to bring it back to what you, you originally asked about culture, I guess that's that's the long answer there. That's a perfect answer. And uh, I think the most impactful thing you said regarding all of this is the fact that a lot of us, a lot of people still watch television, sports, and we do a lot of bitching and complaining about how government operates. In reality, we should be going into these city council meetings demanding accountability and transparency, asking questions, making sure there's no uh, monopoly on contracts, misappropriation of funds, all kinds of shit. Between me and you right now, let's see how many channels we can uh, shout out that go into these meetings right now, right? Jersey Watcher that I know of, you, Lawrence Accountability. Um, what are some other channels that you know of that go into city council meetings and ask questions? Well, I know uh, CJ Grisham, the attorney down in Texas, has a, one of his clients is, uh, what is his name? Jason, um, I forget his name, but he, he goes in and he speaks at these uh, city commission meetings down there. Is it and Followell? Some... Jason Followell? Follow yep, yep, that's him. Yep. Yeah, he's he one that, that I know of. Yep. He's one that I know of. Um, uh, I, I'm sure there's other. I, I've seen I've seen some recent videos that now these aren't people that you know are, have a channel that go in and and, mm. and that's what they do. But I've seen you know there was one lady um, that was speaking and she she was just speaking and the mayor stopped her and ordered the police to come up to her and just they grabbed her and cuffed her and manhandled her out of there. 
I don't know if you know which one I'm talking about. It was a redheaded lady. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And she's like, my daughter's here. What are you going to do? I mean, th that's the kind of stuff that every American that sees that. It, it, first of all, if you see that and you're okay with it and you go, yeah, fuck, she, she deserved it, then you are not an American and, you know, right. I have nothing to fucking say to you. But also, if you're an American and, and you see that shit happening and it doesn't have some kind of uh, emotional impact on you in some kind of way that you feel that your your brother and sister is being violated like that and that you can make that logical connection that that could be you. Yes, right now you're not up there speaking. You don't have that opinion, but it could be you. And and to see something like that happen and, and see that it's unjust, that that should be motivating and inspiring in and of itself to, uh, you know, you know, not show up at that particular meeting, but start to just show up and be like, what, what the fuck is going on? Who are these people that are in charge here? I want to start paying attention. You know, you mentioned Lawrence accountability, Michael, he, he calls it, you know, perfectly what it is, participation. We need more participation in local government. And, and that doesn't mean necessarily running for office or sitting up on the board or speaking or anything. It means just participating in the, in the process. And you can't participate if you're sitting at home. You can't participate if you're on the sidelines. To participate, you got to get in the game. That, that's how you do it. And so you get in the game by, you know, some of the things we were just talking about. Meetings, open records requests protests you know filming always film of course whenever you go in there always film and because you just never know man you just never know what's going to happen um in, in terms of just anything you just you do not know what's going to happen so you need to have it recorded at all times recording in and itself is an exercise of your rights as well so right um is the world round or flat oh man i tell you uh <laughs> Sorry, you can skip this one if you want to. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. Agnostic. The, the only reason why I say that is, you know, so COVID has been such an eye opening experience to me in terms of the lies that we've been fed and that we got fed in real time. We got fed lies in real time and it made me go, well, what else? Clearly, it, it, from 100 years ago, there's got to be no accurate record. If, if they're lying to us in the moment about stuff that I can clearly see with my own eyes, what lie from uh, you, 50, 60, 100 years from now are, are we not getting the whole picture of? And so it really drove home the question, question everything. I always felt, I always thought that, and I always told my students that question ev mm -hmm. everything. Questions, I think I'm cutting out here again. Uh, question everything, question society, question me, question your parents, all that stuff. But it really drove it home for me to the point where I was like, did they lie about the earth being around? You know, I mean, um, but, you know, then it gets into, you know, there's, you know, biblical reasons for, for believing it as, as well. But uh, but I'm just saying overall, uh, we, we, we get lied to so much. There's gaslighting everywhere. There's propaganda everywhere that uh i wouldn't be surprised if the earth was a square really i mean maybe that's, that's my funny favorite. that's what i it's that's just... what i've been saying <laughs> cube <laughs> yeah who knows you know fucking hilarious will you be voting this year and who will you be voting for you don't absolutely. have to answer but you can oh i'll answer absolutely i'll be voting and i'll be voting for trump and if that pisses people off i really don't give a fuck i really i really don't fucking care uh it, it does not matter to me if that makes somebody mad, um, I, you know, to me, there's just, it's, there's no, there's no option. It's a clear cut difference. And, and the thing is, is like, that doesn't mean that I'm like some, you know, Trump person, you know, oftentimes if you, the left always accuses the right Trump supporters of like, you know, following Trump off of a cliff and thinking of him as like a God and a savior. I, I don't think that. And I think, he did some seriously wrong stuff that I agree with during COVID. I, I don't like that he shut down. I don't like that he bent the knee to the left. I don't like that he did the stimulus. I don't like that he did the vaccine. So I, I'm not a follow Trump off the fucking cliff. He does nothing wrong. I'm not that. I, those are serious, serious wrongdoings for me. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the left did those exact same things and more. Uh, and uh, their Harris's position on abortion, mm -mm, nope, unacceptable. I would like to see Trump uh, be all the way against abortion, but I do under I do understand the the rationale. It doesn't mean that I agree with it. I do understand the rationale trying trying to win an election, and that ultimately it, it's going to be incremental to get the abortion views changed and our and our culture changed on on the views of, of abortion. It's going to be incremental, and coming in hot on it might uh, not even allow us to get the the first uh, step that's needed to to create some meaningful change. So I understand that. 
I'd like to see him better on abortion. Uh, but just overall, I, th I just think for me, uh, I think he's going to turn the country around. I think the immigration is a, is a huge, huge thing right now. Um, and so uh, I, I'm hopeful. But like I was saying earlier, you know, this idea of being a silent majority, I, I think it, if it's a majority, it's a slim, it's a razor, razor thin. And because it's razor thin, uh, it's especially important for everyone to go out and vote. I, I, I really don't have any tolerance for the people that say voting doesn't make a difference. I don't believe that at all. I mean, I ran for uh, county commissioner in Douglas County in 20. Cutting out here again. I can tell you firsthand votes, votes matter. Votes count. Uh, and uh, whether you believe it or not, uh, again, it's it's uh, something that as Americans we need to do. And, and I get like people's reasoning for not wanting to vote. They're they're disenfranchised. They're, they're just like, what's what's the point? It's a really defeatist kind of attitude. And I would encourage us not to be defeatist in, in any sense of the word I, with, with what's going on here. Don't get down. Don't get defeated, because then if you uh, decide that, you know, why why bother voting? It doesn't matter. Then you'll say the same thing. Why bother going to a meeting? It doesn't do anything. And speaking of that, just real quick, I know I'm going off topic here, but that, that is a common thing that people say is that, you know, you, you go to these meetings. Well, what's the point? The, the commissioners don't listen to you. And that's really, you know, that's just part of it. That, that's part of the reason why you go. But you'd also go because just to exercise your rights, you have the right to do that. But secondly, uh, to influence and inspire other people because other people are listening. Other people are paying attention and you can inspire them in multiple ways, not just by your words, but just by just by showing up that that inspires people. And conversely, the same thing happens. If, if people are seeing that not a lot of people are showing up, that breeds defeatism. That be, Oh, man, nobody's showing up to this. We're fucked. You know, that, that kind of stuff. So I just encourage people not to be defeatist. And again, I, I just think that's an excuse. I think people go, well, I'm not going to go to the meetings. These commissioners, they don't listen. It doesn't change anything. It's like that. That's that's called an excuse for for your lack, for your apathy and for your for your uh, cowardice. Uh, last last night, for example, me and uh, Lawrence Accountability went to the city meeting. And we uh, we spoke about we pulled an agenda item about the, the the meeting minutes from the previous week were not accurate. And we we asked the commission not to approve those meeting minutes until they accurately reflected the reality of the situation, because it's very important that it reflected the, accurate, the reality of the situation. And to our surprise, the commission debated it. And they took positions and they all didn't vote in favor. Now, they ended up proving it, which was wrong. But a couple of them voted against it. And so afterwards, me and Michael talked and we said that that was that was a beautiful thing to see the process play out right there. Our elected officials took a concern of ours seriously and debated it like they should. Now, ultimately, the outcome didn't go the way that we wanted, but the process fucking worked. And so we're all part of that process. When we say we the people, we are part of that process. And that process includes showing you are part of the meetings you are you are part of the meetings you are not an audience member observing some kind of play on the stage no you are an active participant now you're sitting there silently listening but you are an active participant in our government in our process and and that in itself should be reason enough for you to to go and get involved in it are there people with defeatist mentalities on both sides of the political spectrum I don't know. I, I, I always have viewed the left as incredibly motivated, incredibly. I mean, they, they'll go out and, and burn fucking cities down. I'm not saying we need to be that that motivated. But but what like I was saying is that, you know, during COVID, we saw that 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 double standard obviously applied, that the left was out protesting everything. Meanwhile, they were saying we couldn't gather in big old groups, but they're out there protesting shit. And, and they would they justified it. They said, oh, you know, the you know, racial justice outweighs the it's a health concern, actually. And it outweighs the health concern of covid. Meanwhile, conservatives, even if we wanted to, we, we didn't, you know, and, and I, I really don't know. I mean, you got a whole bunch of conservatives that are upset about the the election in 2020, but you don't ever see like, you know, mass protests taking place over it or anything like that. And the same thing and, and the same thing, you know, if they suspect this, the same kind of, uh, you know, election, you know, stuff going on in 2024. You know, what are we all going to be doing? Just standing with our hands up in the air, looking at each other like, what do, what do we do? And then going back to their their head in the ground. I mean. The, the left is incredibly motivated, so I, I don't see a lot of defeatism there. Um, I, I see it primarily on on the on the right, primarily. And, you know, and who could you know, I, I can blame us, you know, but really, who, you think about it, who could blame us? You know, we are under a massive uh, continual media propaganda 
uh, demoralization campaign to bring us down and, and just show how shitty everything is and how fucked up everything is and 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 how the country's going to shit and, and, and all that stuff. And so it, it is demoralizing, but we got to be able to rise above that. We, we have to, whatever it is, wherever we draw our inspiration from, whether it's religion, uh, you know, whether it's seeing other Americans going out and doing, doing what we're doing, people like you, people like Lawrence Accountability and some of the other people that we mentioned, we need to find our inspiration and, and try to get over that kind of defeatist, um, that defeatist mindset. And, and also the, the mindset, the mindset of, uh, you know, just lacking, I guess, just confidence in, you know, I get a lot of people don't like to go out and speak. I, I understand that. I was a college professor. Students hate getting up and speaking in front of people. I totally get that. I, I really do. Um, but geez, I mean, do we recognize the seriousness of the situation or not? What are we going to say? Like when, when we lose the country, yes, but my, uh, my anxiety about speaking in public was just too much. I mean, just think about that. What, what if like the, the founding fathers were like that? Like, oh man, I, I want to start this revolution and I want us to be free, but I just got too much anxiety. I just can't do it. I, I don't have the confidence to do it. Or Paul Revere, they're like, Paul, we need you to ride the horse. And he's like, oh man, no, I'm, I don't, I don't believe in myself enough, man. I don't have the, I don't have the confidence to do that. We wouldn't be a country right now. So we, we need to uh, get over ourselves in a sense, start to recognize how serious it is. Like if we really think something's wrong with the country and we're bitching and moaning about it online, do you really find it? Do you find it serious enough to get out of your comfort zone enough? Is it that serious or is it just like, are we LARPing here? Are, are, we, LARP, are we live action role playing on this or is this a serious thing? You know, what's crazy is uh, what you're saying. And I can say that uh, you've demonstrated everything you just said with actions because I've seen you work together with Lawrence accountability. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Lawrence accountability leans a little bit towards the left side of the political spectrum. And I hear you speaking mm -hmm. and you're going to be voting Trump, but you guys are able to put your political differences aside and work together because you guys are doing outstanding job working together, backing each other up and helping each other and, and and I gotta say, man, it is it is very powerful and inspiring to see you guys to be able to lead, you know what I mean? And and show people that it can be done. Both sides yeah. of the political spectrum can work together and, and start focusing on the real issues, the real problems, the real people that create these problems and act like they offer a solution because they're they're not offering a solution. So big ups to both you guys yeah. on that. I think uh, you guys are leaders in that sense. And in reality, I think that should be highlighted. I mean, that's why I'm speaking on it now because nobody's ever highlighted this about your channels. And I, I've noticed this and I've seen this as both of your channels continue to grow. I gotta say, man, both of you guys do badass work and I've seen Lawrence accountability in there kicking ass. And it's just, it's amazing to see, bro. Well, brother, I, I appreciate you uh, recognizing that and saying that. I, I really do, man. And, uh, you know, that's what I think makes it, uh, me and Lawrence Accountabilities, the work that we're doing, makes it unique. And the uniqueness is what what's interesting about it is because like, you're right there. Michael would lean what would be more traditionally like a liberal. He, he's got a lot of liberal values. And part of those liberal values are, you know, freedoms, freedoms as traditional liberals, not, not right. left wing current day contemporary crazy whack job lunatic liberals no right. traditional liberal and so yes we, uh from the very get-go uh we both were very clear with each other that our pol our political views are uh you know opposite in a lot of areas um but what's the unifying part of it what you need is that we're americans michael saw i don't know if you can still hear me or not i, I can't i, I can I'm hear you now here but yeah if you can okay um michael saw speaking at meetings and how I was being uh, treated uh, in terms of my rights being violated. And as any true red blooded American should, he said, uh, uh nope, uh, I ain't having that. That, that is not right. He, he recognized that the, the violation of my rights was a violation of his rights is a violation of every, everyone's rights in, in, in the, in the true sense of the word. Um, so, so he started to stand up. And, and when I mentioned that it, well, the work we're doing is unique, I, I hope that, it, again, inspires people, like you just mentioned there, to see that 
we all need to come together. Th this whole left right stuff uh, is, is what really does divide us. W what unites us is that first and foremost, and really only, is that we're Americans. We're all Americans and we all have these same rights. And so when these rights get violated, it's a violation of everyone's rights, uh, whether we want to think it or not, because, mm -hmm. you know, in the future, it could be us. I mean, that's another thing Kobe taught me is that you just never know. There might be an issue that happens that you cannot anticipate. I mean, who anticipated COVID coming and changing the world like it did? Something else might come down that all of a sudden now you're on the opposite side and you have a very unpopular opinion and you want to go speak about it. And then your rights are shut down. It very well could happen. And another thing along with that is that, you know, when, when someone's uh, when one person's free speech rights are violated, everyone's free speech rights are violated because in shutting down someone's words, you're preventing the hearer, the person listening. You're preventing that person from hearing free speech. And that prevention of free speech makes it so that you cannot hear it and learn from it and grow from it and change your mind and change your opinion. And that's precisely why they want to shut down free speech. They don't want that speech getting out into people's ears to change their minds. And so they'll shut it down. They'll shut it down. And so uh, one person's free speech violation is everyone's because everyone is a hearer at that point. And you're being deprived of your freedom to hear what is being said in society. If the government is doing that, your rights are being violated. And so but going back to what I was just saying, I think that's a testament to Michael, to Lawrence accountability, a testament to him as a person. But also it's a testament to everyone else that sees what's going on that didn't stand up. It's only Michael that's standing with me. It's only me that's standing with Michael right now. It's a testament to everybody else that is not standing up as well. And it's a, it's a clear contrast between American looks like, like Michael standing up and what people that maybe think they're Americans are and not doing anything. It's a clear contrast of the difference. We are beginning to see little by little more videos of people going into the city council meetings. Uh, this one girl, I think she's a high school student. She's destroying them. Right, I'm sure you've seen that as well, and just yeah. it's it's really nice to see. Um, I seen it immediately uh, with Cristo at Jersey Watcher. I seen what was happening over there, and right away I gravitated towards him because I'm like, holy shit! We started off, you know, with the Rodney King uh, beating, recording, and found out that we could record police checkpoints. Right, then we started doing cop watching and cop blocking and then cop watching. And then we started doing First Amendment audits, going into these buildings, asking questions, you know, letting them know that we have the right to go in there, and record and ask questions while ask questions while we're recording. Right. And then I started to see, oh, shit, uh, records requests, uh, city council meetings. This shit is next level shit. This is where we as a people need to be advancing our minds and helping each other grow and teaching each other how to hold government accountable. And I got to say, this is next level shit, man. Going into the city council meetings, demanding answers. I love I love what I'm seeing, bro. Yeah, absolutely. And and there are uh, you did a great job just kind of highlighting the, all the steps along the way. And, and there's there's other steps and even even at more levels. I mean, district attorneys, district attorneys are elected officials. Uh, they can be held accountable in the public square as well. Recording and records request as well. That's another area. As well, I mean, I had that interaction with Josh Seiden, who was a deputy district attorney, and he ended up losing his job over it. And so there are things, uh, there are other, there, all areas of government uh, can be looked at. Uh, police, police, obviously, is one that, you know, you, you can see them out in public uh, for for commission meetings and DA stuff like that. You have to go to them, that, that kind of stuff, more or less. Um, but yeah, we, we, there's, there's all kinds of areas that we can be, we can be focusing on. Outstanding. So we're going to be ending this here pretty soon, but I want to give you the floor and I guess you can answer this question and then just have the floor, take as much time as you'd like. What do you want people to take from your work? Well, um, I want them to be inspired and um, to, to go out and find their voices as well to, to start holding government uh, accountable in whatever sense that it is. But just primarily be inspired them as people to find, you know, the courage to go and do that stuff, to, to find the desire and the passion to go do that stuff. 
you know, when I when I started uh, that mass protest, I started it in July of 2021. And for that first month of it, I sat out there every single day and I was out there for by myself. I sat there thinking about, you know, I had just I had lost my job at Washburn and I sat there thinking about how, you know, as a, as a professor, you know, my teaching uh, motto was always to teach is to show. And, and that means for me is to, you know, you show people what you want them to learn and you, you can do that by setting an example. And I felt that that first month that I was sitting out there on the uh, corner by myself felt like a classroom. I had, I had my two signs, which had messages on them. They, they weren't political messages. They were, they were fact messages. They, I said, one sign said, uh, masks on children is child abuse. And the other one said more or less, uh, that it would disrupt development and that it would disrupt attachment. Those, the, those are primarily what my sign said. And I felt like I was educating people. I sat, sat up on a very busy street corner and, you know, hundreds of people drove by every single day. I was sitting out there hours. So over time, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people saw my message. And for me, that that was no different than than being a teacher. And, and that's what teachers need to be doing. So I when I was a teacher at Washburn, I taught in the human services department and we, we do a lot of uh, advocacy work or, or teaching advocacy. And uh, one of the projects that I ha always have my students do that we require them to do is called a, a service learning project. And they go out into the, the community and, and, and work in the, in the community and, vo and volunteer. And I also had another assignment that went along with that. It was a ripple of hope assignment that I made about how we, uh, you know, um, it's it's hard to create social change. The individual looks at creating social change, and it's very hard to do to the point where it becomes almost overwhelming. One person looks at this massive system that needs change and goes, what the fuck am I going to do? I'm one person. I, I can't do that. But what ends up happening is if one person goes out and do, does it, then this rippling effect ha potentially can happen. One person goes out and does it, a person sees it happen, and then they go and do it, and then the person sees them, and they go and do it, and then it ripples out. And, and you go from one person to 10 people to 100 people doing their thing. And so one person didn't change society, but one person changed one person who changed one person. And I always felt like, you know, oftentimes these professors in academia, they're, they're in their ivory towers. And what that means is they just sit up in their soft, cushy, safe jobs on a college campus somewhere and kind of just wax and, you know, more, uh, philosophize and, and, and pump out their research to the to the to the masses that we have to follow along with. But meanwhile, they've been so comfortable up in their ivory tower. They're so disconnected from from what it's like to be on the ground. And so I always felt like if I was going to have my students do these things. I needed to put my money where my mouth is. And that's kind of always been my motto on all this. I'm put my money where my mouth is. I can't expect people to go out and do something that I myself aren't going to do, wh whatever it is. Like, like I can't tell people to go out and, and, and take ch take chances and suffer consequences of losing their families and jobs if i myself haven't done it i can't say you guys go do it i'm oh, i'm not gonna do it no i had to go out and do it and so i was sitting on the, the corner there for that first month i that that's what it started to, to feel like that that was that was my classroom and I, and I was teaching people and so you know to go back to the answer there what i hope is that i'm i'm teaching i'm teaching people whatever it is, people get their own lessons. It could be a lesson in um, how to how to go speak at a meeting. It could be a lesson in passion. It could be a lesson in persistence. It could be a lesson in argument, Wh whatever it is. I hope that uh, people watch and they learn and they, they grow and that they're inspired and that that in, in inspiration that they're feeling turns into passion that they feel. And once you get that passion and you have that that fire in your belly, you can be an unstoppable force as one person. And, and then and along the way, along the way, you can meet other un unstoppable forces and you will meet other people. So I met Lawrence Accountability. I met you, David. I met you through Lawrence Accountability, actually, um, a couple of years ago through, through a connection through him. And, and so uh, we will start to kind of have a snowball effect, but we will not do that if we're all uh, looking at each other going, no, you do it. No, you do it. You know, we all have to do our own part and we all have to do it under kind of the, the umbrella of, uh, being Americans. So we're, we're doing our part as Americans for our country, how fortunate, how lucky we are that we are living right now to be able to do that. You know, the, the history stuff written in the, you know, during the revolutionary war, that's not like history stopped at that point. We have the country forever now. No, 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 no. We have to do our part. We, we just have to. 
Otherwise, we, we will lose the country. And it's a very sobering thought to think that, you know, once the light of, you know, American democracy goes out and we succumb to whatever ideology is taken over, it's communism, that light's going to go out forever. Because if we're not stepping up right now and we have the protection of our rights with us, we're definitely nobody's going to be stepping up when the when those rights are gone. So that light will be extinguished forever because there ain't going to be any Paul Revere's coming along. There ain't going to be any George Washington's. The, the, it's right now. It's right now. And so how fortunate are we to be able to have all these opportunities as well at our disposal to go out and, and make a difference, to go out and use our voices, to go out and exercise our rights? Yeah, I think you're right. I, I know for a fact it feels good to be living a life and being embedded in this i don't feel like this is a wasted life i don't feel like i'm doing it all for nothing um will we create change there's a lot of people out there who have the idea oh there's no community we're never going to create change yada 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 maybe i'm optimistic maybe i'm a wishful thinker but i continue to push forward because i do believe that we can inspire enough people to get up and to question authority and to demand accountability and transparency, to be able to stand up, like you said, and say, nah, this ain't going to happen. We're not going to allow this. I'm an American. And even though that guy has a dif different political view than, than I, hey, let him speak. As long as he's not hurting someone, creating victims, hurting kids, doing something, you know, then let them speak. Even if the person wants to be just an evil, bad person, let them speak as long as they don't do something that, like I said, violates your rights or whatever. And I do believe that this country needs to focus more on our natural rights and why the Constitution was written to limit the scope of authority of government. And, uh, and I got to say, man, I commend you on your work, Lawrence Accountability as well. I think both of you guys working together can actually show this entire country and the world how it can be done so i want to say thank you for all of your tremendous work bro and i love to see where your channel is going you're a fucking straight up american badass well thank you brother i, I appreciate all that man i appreciate that and of course i appreciate all your your work as well you're a you're a og in this and and part of uh you being an og that you've taken on the responsibility of is helping up and coming channels like me and so I always appreciate the, the support. So my channel is growing uh, because of, uh, of your help as well. And so I'll always remember that you when I started my channel, you're the first person that plugged my my channel. I got 1400 subscribers right off the bat. I was a I had I was a nobody YouTube channel and, and you helped that. So, man, I, I'll always uh, appreciate that and I'll always respect you, man. You're welcome, bro. Thank you for that as well. I appreciate your appreciation. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, guys, that's a uh, dreaded rabble rouser. He is, like I said, an American badass. You guys uh, definitely go subscribe to his channel. And we're going to plug in Lawrence accountability as well. These guys are working together out there doing outstanding work. Uh, I do believe that you deserve a lot more subs. Your channel is growing fast right now. I do see other channels uh, highlighting your work as well, which is outstanding because who the hell can deny what you're doing? Like, what you're doing is fucking amazing. The way you speak, bro. The way you hand them their ass and you show them their hypocrisy. You spoon feed it to them. Like, I gotta say, man, it's outstanding fucking work. This is the kind of shit that should be shown in TV, on movies. Mainstream media should be, you know, eating this up and just loving it and, and feeling it and getting empowered and inspired by it and... Yeah, I hope to see where a day where you continue to grow and inspire more people and everybody else gets inspired as well. Yeah, man, I, I hope for that, too. And it's it is kind of the it's been the damnedest thing. Like, yeah, I would uh, my my channel has been growing and, and I and I'm getting some good views on my videos and I and I appreciate all of it. Um, but I'm I'm wanting to, you know, I'm a like. I've been saying I'm a teacher, I'm an educator to grow as much as possible so that you can get more and more eyes on it because uh, the, the, you know, knowledge is power and it needs to spread and people see this and get the message out there. I want as many people to to see that. And so, again, that's why I appreciate your your helping me out with that as well, man. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, thank you for all you do. Thank you for your service to this country, not just once, but I believe more than once. 
uh, because I do believe that you're serving your country again. So thank you for, for that. All right, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, Justin. Good speaking to you, bro. Everybody go subscribe. You too. Later, brother. All right, man. That was Lawrence Accountability. You guys go check him out. Outstanding, outstanding man. Outstanding man. Good man. A really good man. From the very first time I started speaking to him, I was like, this guy's smart. This guy's doing good work. So, shout out to you, Justin. Thank you for all your work. Dr. Justin Spees. Outstanding. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you on the next one.